Hey y'all, it's Alexis from Ask Alexis here. And I have a very special guest. This is one of my brother's best friends, also known as the real life Grumpy Bear. Um, <laughs> this is Rob and I've been knowing Rob for, I can't even believe it, 22 years to be exact, Rob, almost. Um, <laughs> so, you know, Somehow life just kind of creep up on you like that. And just like life creep up on you like that, it might creep up on you to forget to like and subscribe to this channel and share this episode because you're going to find value in it. So um, on a comfy couch, we talk about all things personal transformation. If you have not been on this couch before. And then I don't know if I've ever said this on the channel. I have a personal life mission to help restore love to those who have been oppressed and this is one of the ways that I do it. A lot of the other one, the other ways that I do it is coaching and it's multifaceted coaching. I uh, teach allyship to white women who want to uh, be an ally to the BIPOC population. I help couples learn to connect and transform their relationship and get the fire burning again. I, uh, and then I help people, individuals transform personally to fall in love with their authentic selves because I feel like if you heal yourself, you heal the world, but there is no self without community. And when any of those things get severed, the world get damaged. So that's why I do what I do. Now we got Rob here because I've known Rob for 22 years and I've seen Rob go through many phases of his life. And now Rob, how old does that make you? I'm 44 years old. You're supposed to say none of your business because now they're going to know it's not my 11, my 27th birthday when I had an 11th annual 27th birthday. I told you that before we started, Rob. See, this is how big brothers do. Uh, <laughs> they I'm just you I'm, out. I'm sorry. Don't worry about it. Um, and so how, Rob, how I met Rob is my brother and him, they both started working at the same place. And it was this new place that was opening in town called a casino. And um, they needed a whole bunch of employees. And then it turned out we lived in the same apartment building. And my brother and Rob were both young fathers. And so they had a whole lot in common and a whole lot of toxic masculinity. And so they bonded over the things that they had in common and their mutual complaints. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Toxic. Right, That's crazy. Uh, you said toxic what? Masculinity. I didn't hear you, Rob. What'd you say? You, you said toxic masculinity. I bet you me and Phil would just say we were just who we are, you know? I'm sure. I'm sure. And I kind of am only being a little bit tongue in cheek <laughs> when I say y'all had toxic masculinity. Because the other <laughs> thing that I know. I about that with somebody the other day. So you're right. We did have a lot of that. Um, but I will say this. The other thing that I know about that, the reason I can say I'm only being tongue in cheek, you got your thumb over the lens. Um, I'm sorry. The reason I can say I'm only being tongue in cheek is because I also know how we grew up and it was some, uh, let's just say stickiness in the mix that might, uh, you know, it might cause you not to think about things outside of yourself. And then I also feel like you know, it's okay to punish things that make you angry or feel uncomfortable. Right, right. Um, I agree. I ain't saying it's right. The world is a better place when we undo that kind of behavior. But I do know where from whence you came, which is why I want you on the show. Like, I want yeah. you to talk about you and how you got to be the man you are today. I mean, there was a long struggle. <laughs> so... I mean, I've been on my own since what? Like, when you met me, I was actually living with my mama when you met me. But before that, I hadn't seen my mama in, like, since I was, like, 16. So when you met me, I probably was, like, 20 or 21, 22, in that age bracket. And I hadn't seen my mama since I was, like, like I said, 16. She, like, actually went and gave up custody of me and let me and because she thought I was just so bad, and she moved on with her life. So like when you say how you were 16, where'd she leave you? 
Well, with my sister, and my sister was had a section eight and was living in some in some projects down the way where I'm from, and um, I went to stay with her. And my mama got married and moved to Florida, so my mama been married four times. So like that's just every every husband is a story. So okay, okay. So how did that make you feel when your mama gave up the rights to you? At that time, you when you were young, I ain't care because uh, she wasn't even really around. She was working so much because. She was chasing after these men that wasn't shit. I mean, a couple of them was okay, but a couple of them wasn't. So I was like, I felt free. Like I could just go be grown. Like, you know, when you that age, you be wanting to be grown. But when we was growing up, ain't the same as now. You know, yeah. in the 90s and the 80s was uh the night, it was the 90s. So it was, it was, it was wild still. Crack was still, you know, going crazy. It was wild. So tell me what you mean by wild. Just and because I have a mixed audience. And one of the other things I like to do is bridge perspectives across the world. So without telling too much of your personal business, because I know what you mean by wild. You know what I'm saying? Get your version of what you're comfortable with so people can kind of get an image of what wild is. I mean, um, I was out. My sister was dating. My sister's, all she dated was drug dealers. Pretty much all her kids' daddies was drug dealers. And, um, they were selling drugs and um, they was uh, they was a big influence on me. So they was trying to get me to sell drugs and I, I did, I sold drugs. So where was your father? My father was actually, a, at this time, I'm not 100% sure where he was at at 16, but I know that when I was younger than that, he was a crackhead, but he eventually got himself together. Okay. And was, was, it became a truck driver, you know, so, you know, that's what I am now. So I don't know if that, he eventually, I mean, back then he was for sure a crackhead, but I'm not sure where he was at. Okay, so let me, um, can I just reflect back to you what I heard so far? Okay. Okay, so what I heard back was you were 16 when you were, uh, your mother decided she didn't want to be your, uh, responsible to be your mother anymore. And she prioritized her relationship over the responsibility of caring for you. Pretty much. I mean, my mother worked at 36th District Court, too. You know that, right? For 40 years. So she didn't just she didn't just give up custody. She went to a judge that was a friend of hers. That's how you know it's a lot of backdoor shit with these courts. She went to a judge and got the paperwork and all that stuff signed and sealed without ever actually going to court. Like, a judge actually signed it. They 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 gave me, like, um, they made me, like, an emancipated adult. Okay. And so then she gave me the paper, and she gave me I was receiving social security because my daddy got shot. So he was like supposed to be disabled. So we was receiving social security. My sister turned 18. So I was getting, it was like 420 every third of the month. So she gave me the, the, the emancipation papers and gave me the check and was like, you grown. You want to be grown, you grown. And she asked me, did I want to come to Florida? And I said, no, I'm not about to go to no Florida. And so she said she got, she married, she out. She left, she uh, left a plane ticket. And we and I just went over to my sister's house and we I, I moved in there. So let me ask you this: How did that make you think your mama felt about you? I don't know. Everybody be asking me that, but I never remember feeling that nothing different. Like she always wasn't really, never really there. You know, we was always at my auntie and my grandma's house growing up. My mama got a twin sister, so it's like having two mamas when your mama got a twin. So we was always in Rudge in the projects on the back street growing up so when we would see our mama it would be the weekend like my sister was grown way grown when she, before she was supposed to be so she was always disappearing and doing her thing anyway so she was free that's how she felt and then um uh, my grandma was real strict but she was old so she couldn't control us either so we would just be out in the projects in the hood i mean it was okay it was it was fun it was because you you could do whatever you really wanted to do and that was around the time like i said everybody was selling crack and having money so so do you so you never really thought about it so do, would you think that by that time you might have just been used to the disappointment having to take care of yourself i don't think i got was hurt until i got grown like oh oh and i realized like look at all these mothers like i'm seeing these mothers love their kids and how much i went through trying to be a father when i really when it hit me like i can't remember the day at a time but it just hit me like damn my mama didn't give a fuck you know, that's when it, it just hit me like one day. Like, I don't remember when I, I don't want to lie to you. So one day it hit me, but I don't think it was when I was young. When I was young, it was just so much fun 
growing up in the hood in River Rouge and the projects and all the people making money and my sister dating these drug dealers and, and just running around. It was just so much fun. It was always something until I was homeless. And then that was when I was like, I knew I had to fend for myself. It was no mama, no daddy. It was, you no. Know, that's when it things kicked in. But I wasn't really missing my mama. I was just feeling like I needed to do this or that to do, you know, take care of myself, you know? So do you think you had to think about more things than most people would at your age? Because... Oh. You didn't have, you couldn't think of no parents caring for you. Like you don't, you didn't have an idea that your parents would care for you. Absolutely, because I look at these kids now. That's like, like my stepson Jay. He about to be fifteen, and Kaya. You know my daughter. She's sixteen. I was thinking to myself, I look at these kids. They so little and young, and I was like this age and was out there, like grown, like after hours and running around and in the passenger seat. And so let me ask you this. When you look at the two ways, which one do you think is more uh, is better for the child? Oh, I wish I could have been a kid. Okay. I wish I could have been a kid because I feel like I'm 65 in my body and mind. Like my heart, my mind is old. Like I feel like I'm 65 years old. Okay, so can I, um, so I've been through some stuff too and I had to grow up kind of early and I had an addict parent, as you know. So... One, I loved your mama though. Don't talk to don't, her. Don't say it. So first of all, you don't have to like tell me how to love my mama. I love my mama. I loved you. I said I loved your mama. I know, and I appreciate you protecting my mama. I appreciate you protecting my mama. But please yeah. understand, I honor my mama and I keep an altar and I commune with my mama still to this day. Do so, you remember that your mama used to watch Lisa? I, my mama always was a mama. That's the thing yeah. about my mama. She was a nurturer. That was the weird effect on me where I had to grow up real fast and learn how to think about things and I could never relax because of how her addiction played out, right? Like because she was so loving, so warm, so smart, so helpful, so everything when she was not uh, actively using and then when she used, she'd be gone, ghost. Like you never knew, like what all of a sudden everything changed. So uh, that was a different experience, but I wanted to s reflect some back to you that I've noticed when I started meditating and kind of just trying to explore some of my feelings, I cut off for having to figure out how to survive. So I asked you if you had to think about stuff a lot, right? Like if you had to think about more things than other kids your age. And then before we started talking, you told me you had anxiety. Very bad anxiety. So what happened is, it'd be overactive mental activity. But then you described an environment when you learn to think real fast like this, where shit was always going, zippity boom, and shit wasn't always good. And then you didn't have a nurturing experience and you was always bouncing around, so you never had no consistency. So right. then you always gotta be thinking about how to fit, what to belong, what's the rules of this house, what's to this, what's to that. So your mind been trained to be overactive, thinking about how to survive. Right, I read that about anxiety too, you right, I read that. So one of the things that I had to do when I started meditating was recognizing when I would be thinking about just because like during like recognizing if I have a reason to feel unsafe, seeing what I'm thinking about and then like kind of like exercising, choosing to insert a different thought. And then I also had to be careful about watching stuff or reading stuff that simulated my fears. Because what I learned is once I got my mind off my fears, I could use that same rapid speed and thinking about stuff to go at my desires. Right. But it take time and it take practice, but it is worth it to become a tender heart, okay? <laughs> you do you don't have to be grumpy bear rob you can do the work and be a tender heart because i see you now 20 years later yes you was a single father and i'm gonna just tell on you y'all lisa i love you i wish i was this version of me when i seen this happening but know this he was a child too so and grew up super rough Rob used to, like, he was a, a young father of a daughter, and he would say stuff to his daughter, like, quit acting like a base head if she would do some strange or kid-like, right? But that's because Rob really did have a lot of love in his life. And then Rob just, he also always has been extra, like, I'm going to think about the bad things. Um, 
And I'm not blaming you. I'm just observing you, Rob. I, I feel you know me, so I don't, I'm not, you telling the truth. But I got a question though. Right. How many of them bad things that you thought about actually happened? Like, give me like a percentage. You talking about like when I be thinking in my head, like bad stuff going to happen? Like when you just thinking about whatever bad things, the number of bad things, like the quantity. Probably, I'm talking probably, about. Probably how many zero. Of, yeah. Probably zero. Only z no, you've been through some like two. I or mean, three things. no, I'm saying you said the things that I think in my head. Like I'm, I'm totally fucked up with anxiety, right? So <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm serious. Like my anxiety. I is just bad gotta let you know, though, Rob. On this show, we don't criticize ourselves because self talk is also a stimulator of anxiety. Right, but so I mean, yeah, I mean, maybe if if, if it's ten, I say two things happen. I mean, okay, so that means you got to be average on life. I guess, I mean. I'm just saying, in the school, the way we did it, you get to 80%, you hitting a B. It might be a B minus, but it's a B. That's true, I take it. So, when you think about it in that perspective, is it an efficient use of your mental energy to be thinking about all of that shit when pretty, when like, you might've been through some fucked up shit. I'm not mitigating, I'm not minimizing what you've been through, but like, you know what I'm saying? Bees get bees is above average and they get degrees. You right. I agree. It, it is a waste of energy, but I can't help it. It's not like I'm like wanting things, these thoughts, you know what I'm saying? It's like when you, you the older you get, the more you expect bad shit to happen because that's all you've ever been through. And I mean, I, I, I see this is where I call bullshit because I've been knowing you for 20 years and only like for the earlier part of them years was shit actually all you ever been through. Now you a whole ass family man with seven kids driving a truck, got a freaking football team, a loving wife who loves nurturing and taking care of you and singing your praises. Like, and you still be on that, I'm only one me, I gotta prepare for the bad shit mindset. But that's because you can't you can't erase the memories from the past. Like you can't. It's I'm like, not asking you to erase no, the memories, Rob. I'm asking you to choose how you live with them, motherfuckers. I'm trying. You know what I'm saying? It's not like I'm doing this shit intentionally. You know, if it, right. if, if I wasn't doing this shit intentionally, if I wasn't if I was doing it intentionally or wasn't trying to be normal, then there would be no need for psych psychiatrists or or life coaches or none of that. If I could just be like, okay, you know what? Fuck all that shit. I'm about to go be happy over here. I would do it. You think I wouldn't do it? I think you would, Rob. So let me, so I'm glad you said it that way. I know it's not intentional. The work that I do with people is teaching them how to be intentional and learn to develop that skill so they don't have to experience life at the effect of their thoughts. So it's not that you can't do it, it's that you haven't learned how yet. And a large part is changing some of the way you describe stuff. You know why? I'm going to just say this. Changing some of your language in Rob, first of all, it make you think about something better. And then, right, like that is just an activity that's spent when you have to change your language. But then, too, your language affects how you see the world. It's the way you describe your perception. So thinking about having to say it in a different way makes you think about seeing it in a different way. And then you pick one that feels better instead of one that feels worse to hold on to. Right. The reason you do that is not to transform your whole entire life. It's because in that moment, feeling better feels better. And that makes sense. I agree 100%. It's easier said than done. I've been working at it for four years since I've been conscious doing it. I'm not, and I still got a therapist and a spiritual advisor. I'm not telling you it's easy. I'm telling you it's worth the work. And I, I want like, so I'm, first of all, I'm coming at you just a little hard to make it interesting on the show. I want y'all to know if you want me to be your coach, I would not, I don't, I, I have blunt compassion, but this is like a brother to me. So I can like give him a little bit of extra oomph. Um, no, you're all right. I mean, I, I, I feel what you're saying, but I'm saying it's easier said than done. It's easier said than done. I maintain that. Like, you know, you talked about, you was talking to me about 
like when my mama left, like I had a childhood way before all the shit was before that was was a lot of terrible shit too. So I mean, just being a kid was fuck, fucked up. Not just being a teenager and an adult. So like those memories don't fade, and it's always was drama, always was some shit, especially growing up in a project. Sometimes you take on other people's other your neighbor's shit when you're in a project because everybody lives so close. So Rob, I I really do appreciate what you've been through. And I can't say that my, I don't want to get into comparing traumas, but I know for me and my experience, like even me and Phil sometimes talk about how we live different lives, even though we got the same model. Right. We six years apart. So the version of mama I had and the version of mama he had was two different versions. Not to mention he had a fuller family. My elders been dying since I was four. I had three boyfriends die on me. My mama would be gone for weeks at a time. My brother, when I was a freshman in uh, high school, didn't live with us no more and went away to college, but he also spent a senior year living somewhere else. And we moved to the hood when I lived in the suburbs. So I'm feeling extra unsafe. My mama's still doing her thing. And we in this house, like, so I'm not saying that I understand everything that you've been through. What I'm saying is that I am aware that there are cumulative effects of having trauma happen to you early in your life. Right. And that it is still worth doing the work to be intentional about, intentional about changing the way you see the world because it feels better. You said you feel like you're 65. You can do the work to feel younger. You don't have to carry all that stress in your body. I, I, and I, I know because I've done the work and I still, and here's the thing about doing the work. You don't do the work to get an instant fix. You do the work to learn how to live life and navigate life so you can have one that you want, even though you're affected the way that you are by the life you lived already. That sounds good. That do. I mean, I feel like most of us, a lot of us are suffering from PTSD too. Poverty is violence. Yes, we are. And not only does it breed violence, it is violence. And here's the thing. A lot of us also don't understand that that's a systemic issue. So another thing that happened for me with doing my societal work with allyship, Rob, is I was able to forgive my mama for her addiction because I got to see it as a societal issue that she was traumatized by as well. Because getting you hooked on drugs, pumping crack into communities and getting you hooked on drugs, by the government, that's a violent offense when I think I about the effect that that shit had on my life. However, I, I can imagine being the addict. So as much as you love all your kids and you do what you do because you love your kids, can you imagine letting them down in that way? Hell no. <laughs> exactly, but they got hooked on something that was flooded in our communities by the government. And so the thing that happens with people of color or people who've had marginalized identities is that if you understand it's an outside force attacking everybody in the community, and when people have effects of them outside forces, you're able to give more grace, thus not victimize yourself as much. And if, when you don't victimize yourself as much, you're not stuck in a, a, a mind of anxiety, thinking about all the things that can get you. You're thinking about all the things you can create. You go from surviving to thriving. Right, I agree. You go from being afraid of connection because somebody might get you to desiring connection and learning to read people for the good qualities instead of being afraid of the bad qualities. That's true. You're right. I agree. And so don't that sound like, don't you want to lay some of your burdens down? I want to. I'm try to. But when I wake up in the morning, they be in my pocket. <laughs> All so right. It's not like, you know, See, so. but let me tell you how you stimulate them. Shit that make you feel right. Right is a feeling a lot of people like because they feel in control, especially right. people who've been through trauma. Right. So stuff that make you feel right instead of like you want to love. Stop doing it. Start doing loving things. Like sit up and think about, instead of thinking about how much something pissed you off or what you got to be afraid of, say, you know what? I'm supposed to be thinking about what I want to love and see how much shit you could come up with it. 
Like do a brainstorming activity where you just write down everything that come up. Or if you can't write it down, record something on your phone or type it like it's a comment on Facebook because you sure be saying trolling on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> just so you could feel right or feel like you pissed somebody off. Yeah, I don't be trolling though. I can't, I say this, you might not <laughs> speak to troll, but you sure will take the opportunity to stick a jab and twist and to pour a little salt. But who do I be talking to when you see me doing that? Somebody I, that's saying some racist bullshit, right? I, here's the thing. I agree with your position. I'm telling yeah. you that still doing that as an activity has a negative effect on your state of being. Oh, see, I didn't even realize that because I actually enjoy that part. Because <laughs> so. you enjoy feeling right because you like feeling in control because right now your brain is linked that control equal peace. I guess so. <laughs> I don't know. That's crazy. When you think about, so understanding is what determines if something's a problem or not, right? Yeah, I guess, I mean. Shout out to Reverend Galen McDowell. I got that from him. And he be tripping all the time on his stuff about if somebody don't give him his credit. So I want to make sure I give him his credit. So <laughs> understanding is what determines if something is a problem. Like if you know, if it's, here's the thing. If you encounter a situation and you know what to do to make it better, you just make it better, right? Absolutely. But when you don't know what to do, that's when it gets real frustrating. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Understanding is what makes something the problem. I agree. You're right. So understanding these things is not helpful for your mental health and make something a solution. Well, I'm trying to stop that shit. Uh, not trolling, but arguing with these racist people on these internet sites that you see me on saying stuff, but I can't help it because like you explained about crack with your mother, I also feel like they don't agree with the way we've been oppressed and the things that have happened to us. And they just make it seem like we just wake up and say, oh, let's live in the ghetto. Oh, let's, let's kill each other. Let's sell drugs. It's all been a plan. And um, that shit sound crazy when you say it to them because they don't understand it. So that's because they get to experience more than their fair share of safety in the world. Yeah. And we don't. So I agree. But do you, let me ask you this. How often are you successful at making them understand? Probably, probably zero. <laughs> so then, I get inboxes. There, I be getting threatened and all type of shit. But you know, I don't give a shit because I don't believe that they're really real. So, I mean, but I don't but let me ask you this: That's so. What if you thought about the way you spend your mind in concert in units of time? Yeah, I could be doing something else. You know, I could be spending that time with my son and, and sons and telling them stuff. But I do that too. I like to keep them updated on what's going on in the world because nobody done that for me. And I was caught off guard by all this stuff, you know? But don't and, raise them to have your level of anxiety. You can try to not to. I, I'm just not finding out that anxiety could be passed down. I had no idea. So that is something else that, uh, so when I, so here's the thing I want you to know, Robert, not just me, but a lot of other people are teaching the white people who actually do want to know and that are trying to understand about intergenerational trauma and epigenetics and how uh, how even after enslavement, once it became like once it became illegal to enslave people to abuse their labor, all of the other ways which monetary gain was stripped out of the black community, how that the generational violence that is, right. the types of effects. And we teach them perspective. And a thing that I believe is either on my, I know it's on my website right now, so you could check it out. So you can, because I found it very hopeful once I was able to ask them questions at the end of the course, and they were able to reflect back to me the perspective. Not, they don't have to know all the facts, but they, if you understand the perspective, it's a whole lot safer to build connection. Right. Right. Well, I, I, I try not to teach them stuff, but I want them to be aware of what they're facing. Uh -huh. it's, a, it's a thin line because I didn't know. I, I did know, but it's, it's a thin line. And I and I was I was around in the 90s when the crime bills hit, you know, and, uh, and people start going to jail for little or nothing and spending seven and eight years in prison. And I just want them to be aware of the traps that's out there. So it's hard to not tell them that. And I know it's happening. I think they need to know. I mean, what if I'm not here? I always look, like I said, I feel old. So I tell my kids as much as I can because I'll try to feed them as much information, as much information as I can because I was influenced by a lot of people that shouldn't have been telling me nothing. 
So I want them to hear this story from me instead of hearing it from somebody else. So they can always reach back and be like, my daddy said, you know? So what if, I'm not asking you not to teach them how to succeed. So you see how I flipped that language? Instead of teaching them about the pit, instead of teaching them how to avoid pitfalls, you teaching them how to be to succeed? Yeah, I try to teach them both, actually. I mean, I, I don't just teach them about that. So know? here's the thing, though. Like, program their language in for the affirmative. So a part of succeeding is avoiding pitfalls, but you give them the perspective. And the thing that you're actually doing as a parent is teaching them how to think, not just what to think about. Right. So you want to program them for success because they haven't had a life that you had. They have two stable parents who love each other, who are raising each, them together. And their community is a loving household where they're taught the value of connection with each other. So the life, the, some of the fears that you have, they don't have to have if you teach them how to think for the world that they will live. Because they're not going to live the same bullshit you live because you made sure of that. But see, I'm cautious they, of that. Huh? Now that you said that, that you saying that I, I I'm living that like I I also know that it's excuse me I don't want to do I can I just say how can I speak regular or will you want me to talk normal? Or? Be yourself. We authenticity okay. is a part of my brand. Okay, cool. So I know it's niggas out here raising their sons to be savages. You know, everybody not raising their sons like I'm trying to raise mine. So I know it's niggas out here that's raising their sons to be savages, and I know that my sons are going to encounter these niggas. So I also try to teach them about that too. I'm not just teaching them like, oh, here's this trap the white man set. Oh, and, and, and I'm also saying, look, watch out for these niggas too. So I, like, I'm trying to teach them as much as I can. It's not enough time in a day to teach them what I want them to know. So I also, I don't want you to stop teaching them the lessons you've had to learn. I want you to teach them how to think about them. Teach them that there are people who raising their sons like this. Teach them how to link cause and effect. Teach them how to think through a process of evaluating all the factors because the things you encountered and the perspectives you operated from just isn't the same as the ones they are. You can teach them for what, like the hurt, the things that you can see, but you also want to teach them paths to success, not just all of the sharks that's in the water. You got to teach them the, the, the route to swim, when to swim upstream and downstream, expansion and contraction. So you can't just teach them from your fears and you want your sons to know how to love. And y'all model that, but you could also show that when they get older, what they looking at is this is how a man's supposed to act. And in a whole lot of ways, Rob, you get that right. In a whole lot of ways, you get that right. But you, all, you wanna make sure that they know how to connect and you can't teach from what you don't know. That's true, I, and that's a big, big mess up in my life because I don't know how to love like normal so so first it ain't no normal what we so that's the thing too right there love is a feeling and then acts you choose to do to keep creating that feeling right so that's how the way that play out get decided by you and your family right but the way you spend your time is by deciding you want to feel that feeling and doing acts to create that feeling on purpose. That's how to love. That that makes sense, but I've never been taught that. And love is a verb, now right? You have, so. though. Now you have. It ain't about it's you gotta just choose to do it. Cause now you know. Right. And I promise you the formula is just that simple. The way you know how to love, you gotta get in touch with the feeling. And then do stuff to make your body feel like that. Right. So, mm -hmm. Go ahead. Sometimes I feel like it's too late for me. And so I just want them to be able to do it. So I want them to, to you know, to manifest what I couldn't. I want them to be able to, to feel all these feelings and enjoy their life without feeling how I felt. So I focus on them instead of myself. Because I don't, I don't feel like it's a long time though, enough. Rob, Rob, so listen. you never been taught. You a part of your community. And because of how you grew up, you weren't taught that you were a valuable part of your community or that, or the benefit of what love looks like if you also love on yourself. 
your capacity to love them grows if you love on yourself. Right. It seems like you don't have enough time to do it. You'll actually have more time to do it. It makes sense if I if I figure it out and focus, right? It's not it's not about figuring out it and focus. It's not a destination to get to. It's a thing to start doing. Like, so if we got off this call and you said, you know what? I'm gonna try this experience out. What could I do right now to go let everybody in my house know I love them? And then here's the thing. Sometimes you don't know about what things to think about to figure that out. So you will have to go through a thought on a thought train. Like, all right, well, my wife seemed to smile in a way that I like and lean towards me when I do this. Oh, my one son, he always laughing. And when he hurt, he needs somebody to tell him he feel that he is better as opposed to just giving him affection. So then I'm gonna go tell him something good about him. My other son, he like, he, he something happened to him. He needs to be held. It don't matter who around, somebody got to hold him. I'm going to go hug my son and tell him I love him. You can choose to do these things as a conscious effort. And then through the reactions that you get back from the people that you love, you'll get in touch with what that feeling looked like in your body if you pay attention. You're right. I agree with that. That is the work. It's not as much as I know. So you, one of the things that I like to say, but I can't say it right away, is that some of these things are easier done than said. Because a lot of times in the mental effort that we get, we go through to like explain it and say it to ourselves, we talk ourselves out of it. Because it seemed like, oh, I don't know how to do this big thing because of all these huge things that happen to me that's wrong with me. But the little work is doing them things a little bit and a little bit and learning more and more each time you do it. It is true that you haven't been taught. But that oh, doesn't yeah, mean you can't learn. I agree. You can learn. If you want to. I want to. And So I don't do say that. I'm trying to. Say I am. I am. <laughs> I am. Because you are, Rob, because I know you love your children. I know you love your family. I know you love your wife. I got to see it happen in progress. That's like, true. it's a bird. I'm not saying we like ace booms where I see you every day all the time, but I get to see the, the some, uh, I get to know about a lot of milestones. Like, and when you and Jazz got together, y'all's story is kind of amazing in that, like, did y'all get married in like two or three months? Yeah. <laughs> and Rob, you was a whole last stop. And then he was yeah. like, no, I'm not. <laughs> After hold on, months, hold on, hold on. No, yeah, hold on. I mean, I've been knowing Jasmine, though, for, for, for a long time, though. Okay. We've been doing this since the beginning of the casino. We just wasn't dating. We knew each other, though. But yes, I was. I was pretty terrible. I was a womanizer. I'm not going to lie. It was the a whole thought. I, so, was a, I was terrible. I was pretty terrible. So then, like, so let me ask you this. What about Jazz made you feel tender enough to share your heart and life with her after two months? I don't know. She just different, man. She's strong, you know? She don't play that shit. She's strong. Let me ask you this. Do you? So I got to see her as a mother, but do you think that her strength was so attractive to you because what you perceive, like, because of how your mama seemed like she was weak to care for you? Maybe. Because you know what she used to do? She, you know, I had Kaya. Like, this was my second time being a single father was Kaya. So she would come straight in, you know, and check on Kaya. And then that was like, you know, wow, she coming to check on Kaya, you know. That was big for me because Kaya needed that. She didn't have it. She didn't have a mother. Her mother was trash. So... That was that was like the first thing, but I mean, she was fine as hell. I mean, that was easy. So, so let me yeah. ask you this. So, yes, Jazz is a looker, y'all. Um, but what I heard you say is, I saw her doing the act of loving on someone I love, and that made me love her. No, I mean, I liked her I'm on my own. I didn't see. I didn't. I didn't need to see nothing else. I liked her on my own. Then. That was extra, like I said. 
but it was a good extra that made so you liked her but you loved her because of how she loved your daughter or not just because i'm not saying that's the only reason but that's the reason you did just give me i didn't like i only got this information from you i mean i guess yeah i guess i mean pretty much reason, yeah. so i'm trying to tie concepts together in the sense that i told you earlier like all you got to do is the act and the love will follow right really she right. did that one of the things you're telling me you love about your wife as and you see as a strength in her is that and you gave me a specific task which was she would come in and check on my daughter and kaya needed that and so when you see someone that you love's need being meet, met that makes you feel better in the world and then you see someone meeting that need that makes you feel better about that person and what you didn't know happened was your heart got all tender and was like, that's my wife. Probably. <laughs> Pretty much. I guess so. I mean, I ain't never thought about it like that, but you cleared it up. So, yeah. I mean, do you agree or am I just... Yeah, I agree. I agree. I mean, mean did it happen? I agree. Plus, like I said, just being, just dealing with a lot of different women like I was doing, which was wrong. I just knew that... I knew what I didn't like and I knew what I liked when I had what I liked in front of me. Okay, so it was one of those for you, you had to see it to know its value or fear it, feel it, experience it. Yeah, I mean, because I mean, I thought other people was something that they wasn't and then I saw what wasn't, I saw something that was like, okay, yeah, this is it, you know? So let me ask you this, how have you been able to keep it where this is it the whole time i haven't it's a struggle i'm terrible she i have a hard time dealing with my anxiety is terrible so it's been a struggle like it has not easy i mean she probably she really gotta love me probably to have been put up with me all this time well let me ask you this do you think about her not loving you what you mean like so like you just said, you gave a justification for her loving you, but do you think, do you ever have thoughts that she doesn't love you? Mm, I don't know. I really don't know how to answer that. Okay. So that's I, mean, I, I, I mean, I don't know. I mean, she, she would have to, to deal with me all this time. Like I'm not easy to deal with. Very difficult. So she would have to, or it would, I don't know. You, I can't see nobody being with me this long, like eight years, like, so let me ask you this. What if you were to use that and say, all right, I want to learn how to love and learn skills for connection. And I learned that it's just as simple as starting the process. And then say, you know what? I'm going to start in the safest place possible, which is the woman I know who loved me consistently, even though I haven't been easy to love. And I'm going to try to make myself easier to love because I love her. So like, what if the meditation and the focusing on your thoughts was something you could do, it, even though it benefits you, you could start with the motivation of because it'll make it easier on someone who loves you so much. Because I'm gonna tell you this about being a black woman. That strength don't give us time to explore our femininity the way we need to for our own healer. Right. And she need to be able to find a safe place in you and you can't create that for her if you don't know one. That's true, but I mean, my thing is, is that all I ever knew was just taking care of them, taking care of her, making sure she got everything she need, making sure they got everything they need, and I'm finding out that that's not enough. So once again, Rob, knowing that you don't know is, step, is ground zero. You have the ability to learn how if you want to, and you find the reasons that you want to valuable enough to be committed to doing it. That's true. And I mean, I'm trying. That's why I'm here. Like when I, like I said, I saw you. You doing, Rob. You doing. I'm doing. I'm doing. You're right. I'm Engaging doing. Engaging in therapeutic activities is a, is a process. Like learning, th like you thinking about things differently just in this conversation. And yeah, I mean, you, you opening my eyes and stuff. When I go to, I've had counseling before and I've tried to talk to these people, but I mean, it just seems so, it's maybe because it's just you. But I've tried to talk to these people and it just seemed like it was bullshit to me. I mean, it just seemed like it was just somebody just sitting there just going through the motions type of shit. And my, 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 my history, my past, and that's not just going through the motions. So just going through the motions is not enough for me to believe in something to help me. 
So I'm glad you brought that up, Rob, especially for the viewers, because this is something I had to learn over time. Because I tried therapy a lot or counseling um, or coaching in my earlier years without a lot of success because I didn't, I couldn't, I even couldn't like then, like how you said, it just felt like going through the motions, felt like they was just throwing stuff at me. Um, and one of the things that I learned now that I have a commitment and I saved the course is that it take a minute to build rapport because when you've been through stuff, you got to feel like somebody care about you to even be willing to open up and do the work. And you just not going to feel like that about a stranger, whether they paid the work on you or not. True. And I agree with that 100%. intergenerational trauma that we show up to the world with the medical field, um, anything white dominated that started, we have a natural distrust for some of us as a potential because of the medical oppression that we suffered generationally. So cultural confidence is a thing, right? Like I can, there's an experience that I can speak to that's part of the way that I talk to you and reflect your stories back to you that is mental labor that you would have to do if you had someone who didn't understand your background. Right. Being able not to have to do that mental labor allow you to spend that mental labor thinking about the things we talking about. But then too, you also already know I care about you. Right. And that, that plays. But when you start to seek therapy or coaching or counseling, some anything like that, and this goes for anybody, you got to build that and so in the same way you do that in the world, you see how a motherfucker move and you see if that move is right for you or not. And over time, you will know. And it don't take long to figure out it's not for you, but you got to be willing to keep going to find the one that is right for you. Right. And one of the things that helps me with my therapist is a lot of times I have a dream or an idea or something to come down my moonbeam and I'd be like, yes, let's go. And I go and then it get hard and life get thick or I get uh, my PTSD start acting up. And when I talk to her, she reminded me that I told her what I was going to do and I'm in the middle of doing it. And that sometimes it get hard. All I got to do is keep doing it. And she was, and I couldn't tell her she was wrong because I was there when I told her and I knew right. how I felt when I told her. And so, and then when I talk to her, the whole conversation is only about me. So I don't have to do all the stuff that I got to do. Excuse me. I don't have to do all the stuff that I got to do to make sure that I'm being in good conversational skills and I dominate, you know, all of like that extra stuff. I ain't got to think about that because she's there just to help me think about what I'm thinking about. Right. Right. That's cool. I get it. I get it. But it takes it. But you got to prioritize you to be willing to do it. That's true. I'm trying. I'm, I am. I am trying. and I'm going to try a lot harder than what I ever have before. You're not trying, Rob. You're doing. I'm doing. Right. I'm doing. I want to do a lot more than I ever have to work on this. Like, because I'm getting older and I felt like when I got to this age, my life's supposed to be fun. I'm supposed to be doing all this stuff. I mean, you know, all this type of stuff is going on. It's a different type of time in the world. So, but I mean, still, I want to do more when all of this is over. So, a thing that I have um, my clients do sometimes is when they have they make a statement like that i'd be like all right well let's create that person and so because sometimes you got to think about it but thinking about something you ain't never thought about is something else you got to learn to do so i'd be like all right name them a name and i don't want to know the name right don't tell me the name right. and then all of our sessions after that all the goals about personal development that they want to achieve we just send that energy to that person because a lot of times when you haven't learned to think about you, it's easier to put the energy in that person instead of in you. But then by doing the act of putting the energy in that person, you are walking yourself into becoming that person. Right. Because the things you're thinking about is different than they would have been if you wasn't trying to put something into a person you want to be. Right. That makes sense. It makes a lot of sense. It's ways to have it done. And so I pay my therapist out of my pocket. I pay my spiritual advisor out of my pocket. 
but I wouldn't be where I am talking to you on a comfy couch. I wouldn't be where I am in my business with a, you know, only a few spots left for one-on-one -on -one clients. I wouldn't be where I am with my relationship couple clients getting engaged. That was dope. And I would be where I, Yes. That, that was dope. They invited Especially me. That's that. the dope part, being invited, like to, to see the moment. And so he proposed? Wow. Yes. It was a it whole was like, yes, like, I want to love her. I'm going to put forth effort into loving her. Hey, there's a prime example for you. If you do the steps, you get the feeling, you do the thing, and you're excited. He did it on his birthday. So dude's getting a wife for his birthday. Hey, that's my dog. I'm happy for him. I hope he watched this and see that. I, I love that guy. Every, I've been knowing him for a long time. I mean, we met at the casino probably 20 years, too. So let me so, ask I mean, you this. What you love about him? He's strong. He he reminds me of me. He's probably been through a lot. I can tell. I don't even have to know what he's been through. And, and I don't know about his mental health or whatever, but I can tell he's been through something. And I could tell he trying to figure it out, but he 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 got a respect for me that I and then I give it back. We he he give me what I give him. We like we like each other as as men. We friends. I, I like him. If he was like pull up, Rob, I would pull up. Like I like him. He, I think he a good dude. So let me, can I reflect back to you what I heard you value, and you tell me if I'm right or wrong. Yeah, tell me. So what I heard you say you value a thing that make, that you love about people is if they strong and they can weather tough storms. Right. And a thing that you value in a person loving you is being able to be considerate to your feelings even when you're not in control of them. Right. I agree. You see how you just learned something about yourself? Yeah, that was that This was is true. why black men need therapy, y'all, or coaches or healers, because we got to heal as a community and we need to love each other. That man loved his wife. This man loves his wife. Okay, he loves his children. How many sons you got, Rob? Tell them. Tell them. How many sons, I got, Rob? I got five sons. <laughs> five sons. You know, four with Jazz and then her son. So that's five. So I don't even do stuff. I wasn't raised like that. That's five sons. You ain't even have to tell the people. That's your son, too. Y'all been together eight years. It, I would be judging you if it wasn't. Oh, yeah. Um. Well, I would be trying not to judge you. Let me be clear <laughs> no no worries because that's my son too exactly and that's how it should be that's how we're gonna heal as a community right like we gotta assemble this disassembled community and well, i mean you you you, you starting it the way, what you're doing is wonderful because if you could reach out to all black men and get them to lay here and talk to you like this it would be beautiful because because we don't do this we pin it all inside and then we go look at each other all evil and mean all day and then we move on like, that's the stupidest shit ever. Like, I, I swear I wish I could take back every mean look I ever did to every man, black man, but it's, it's, it's there. It's, 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 it's in the atmosphere. We can't change. So, that's what, so you know, I even be going into the prisons and teaching them how to love each other because I want y'all to love each other because then maybe you'll be better at loving us. You, you might be right. I mean, it's hard. Because y'all be because mean as fuck to each other just for shits and giggles. I do not know why dudes are so like, it's like, let me find your weakness and exploit it. Ah. You know, it's so crazy. Cause I was at the liquor store the other night. You know, I went to the store. I don't even know what I went for, but I was, I think I'm playing the lottery, but I'm in line behind this dude. And he just fiddling around with his gun. And he, 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 he messing around with his pen. He was blatantly trying to let me see that he had a firearm on. Him. And I'm just thinking to myself like that, that shit is so weak. Like you, you, that's some bitch shit. Like I, you were not supposed to let me know you have that, but instead, yo, yo, whatever he was feeling, he was feeling like he needed to let me keep seeing that he had it. Like I just, that shit irritated me so bad. I just could not stand this nigga. And it was like, we never saw each other met before. He irritated my nerves so fucking bad. Like it was terrible. Let me and I mean, I had two guns. <laughs> so I was like, this nigga, I got two guns. I, how can I show this nigga I got two guns? That shit is so, so ignorant. So that's so the part ignorant. right there. That part right there is the part we gotta start doing something different at. So you wreck so I think let me tell you something that I think that just came in my moon being Rob. I think you might be an empath. Are you familiar with what that is? Absolutely not. I never heard that. Okay. So first of all, I'm not an expert on them. My uh shout out to Berhenda Williams. She is. 
But what? But essentially, an empath is a person who has a deep connection to things outside of themselves through their perceptions of, of different kinds. The kind I think that you are is one that feel people's feelings. Yes. And I have so always felt like I had that gift. Like, I could feel how a person is feeling. Like, he literally wanted me to know that he kept on tucking his shirt and pulling up his pants and popping it out and fixing it. And I'm like, God, we in a fucking store. Like, I just pay for your shit and go. Like, like I, it was just me and him. So who, who, it was like, I'm like, I'm reading his mind. Like, okay, now you got a gun. Okay, bro. Good so for that you. right there, I'm glad that you, so there are things you can do to disengage from the intensity of the way you feel other people's feelings and then also what you do with the experience of feeling other people's feelings. Because if you feel it and then you think too much about that feeling, you going to start to embody it. So how you was like, and I got two guns and, I, and I'm trying to figure out how I'm going to show him. Now you just started doing the thing you was shaming him for doing. Yeah, this shit been bothering me. This shit happened Friday night. It was irritating me all weekend. And so you see how, here's the thing, by the amount of focus and attention you gave to it, because you are a person who could feel other people's feelings, you still got that shit all running and coursing through your body. It bothered me all weekend. So a way that I was able to, would you like to hear a practice for that? That might be helpful. Sure. Anything, okay. yes, because I do not want to care about something that stupid. So a way that I was able to uh, help myself calm down my anxious mind and worry and the need to, the need to feel like I have to be always worried about what could happen was I would realize that when my body felt fear, first of all, you feel your feelings in your body. You label them with your mind. Hear that. You feel your feelings in your body. You label them with your mind. That makes sense. So when I would feel the sensation that would make me think fearful thoughts, what I recognized through meditation and paying attention to myself was that I, my body is reacting to what's happening. That's my time to look around and see what's happening and see what it is that I need to do. Once I decide what it is that I need to do, I start thinking about how to do that. And then I do that. So in that situation, recognizing that he had a firearm or he wanted me to know, the analysis that you went through was he ain't really about that life. That's why he needs me to know he have it. So that means, but here's the different, here's the new thought. That means he's not a threat. I don't need to prepare myself for threat. Well, yeah, I didn't. I didn't think he was because he kept showing it. Like I, I would be more leery of a nigga that didn't do anything. Just came in, bought something, and walked right out. Like I'd be like, oh yeah, that nigga too quiet. I mean, I don't know. But hold on. Cool. But here's the, so once you say he's not a threat, then you say I don't have to keep paying attention to this, and you don't you spend the time. So you see how you spent the time judging them too? Yeah. Yeah. So that mental activity where you judging them is you absorbing it into your experience. Right. And the thing about judging is we free, it ain't no sense. They, right or wrong is opinions of what it is. But you felt a way about that and you still feeling a way about that today. So if you think about judgment as the way you spend in your psychological time or your psychological activity or you the story you telling yourself in your mind, you will stop doing it because of the effect of the feelings that it makes you feel in your body. And that don't have shit to do with nobody else. Right. But you don't, enjoy, you don't enjoy that feeling. So it benefits you not to judge that dude and think about how soft he, once he's soft, you don't need to think about him no more. You ain't gotta be ready. Yeah, you right. And you could also trust yourself to be ready so you don't have, like, you can give yourself credit for the things you know that you do to keep you safe. Right. Now here's the other side where I've found the value in doing this activity to not think about only what could go wrong all the time. And that value was I recognized through having a dream and then like thinking about how to plan that dream. I know that's how I noticed I was only thinking about what could go wrong. 
I did not know how to think about what would happen if everything went right. And at this time in my life, everything was starting to go right. I didn't know what the fuck to do, which made me crazy. And then I can't even justify the crazy because ain't shit happening wrong. And yet I feel like ready to, yeah. Right, 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 right. And then I feel an extra crazy because I feel like that. It is a cycle. Yes, absolutely. That's crazy. I never thought about that at all, but that is crazy. That's how it happened. So this is why I'm telling you that doing this shit is worth it because you don't have to stay feeling that way if you do the work not to keep feeling that way. And it's for the way you live your life. So once again, just to remind you, I told you I wasn't telling you how to change your past. I just want you to live with it in a different way so you can have a better life. I agree. It's the toxic masculinity is what you called it. That shit is hard to get rid of so i'm gonna tell you like phil tell his his people when he coaching them and his kids it's hard but you could do it it's hard but you could do it but that shit is so instilled in black men like it's all we hear growing up fuck these bitches and slap anybody that talks shit to you you just learn that shit for so long that's what you think you're supposed to be and do is fuck women and, and 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 any nigga that challenge you, if you have to, kill him. That's exactly what we taught growing up for years until you become a man and realize, like, that was awesome bullshit. <laughs> like, That's got to be a real hard realization to have. It is, because everything you ever learned was bullshit, and then now you don't know what the fuck to do. All the niggas that I looked up to is trash, like, now. And, I, and, I, and I, people may see this, and they may even know some of them, but people know who I looked up to. And I mean, these, some of them, I mean, they just are what they are, but they was mostly trash. Like they didn't turn out to be shit. They didn't, they don't have anything I would want to do or be. So most of the message that they gave me is probably the message they received from all the wrong people too. So Rob, I think you're right. And I also think that that's a bigger justification for therapy. But then I want to give you this other piece of advice or this other piece of knowledge I gained from my experience and hopes that it'll help you was the way that I learned how to do this is by teaching people how to do this. So we started this call with, before we got on, me telling you to talk like you was talking to your younger self. What right. you didn't know is it's a reason that I had you get into that perspective. And that is because the way that we heal ourselves is to heal the version of ourselves that was hurt. And you was hurt in your younger life. But I want to also, as a person who know you for 20 some odd years, cheer you on. <laughs> because in spite of all of that that you saw, all of that that you were not taught, all of the difficult choices you had to make and difficult lessons you had to learn, once you got maturity and control over your own life, you mastered your fears way before, especially since you don't already know, you ever realized. You live in life you've been running to this whole time. I guess so. I mean, I guess so. So we got to begin to wrap up, but... I want to give you an opportunity to say anything else you need to say, and then you're going to have to ask Alexis a question. All right. Well, I mean, you asked me, what would I tell my younger self? And if, and if it's somebody that's young, a young black man that's listening, is that just be yourself and don't worry about what nobody else feel about it. And but what, just, if, what if what they feel about it could get me killed? Well, I ain't saying be a cripple or blood because that's what you want to be. I'm saying don't worry about all the, the influences, the outside influences, the worst shit to black men. Somebody telling you this is what you should be doing. This what you should, this what you need to do, or or look, look, I want you to be my little dog. You my little dog. Like you know, that's big because a lot of us don't have fathers. So some nigga that you think, oh, that's that guy. And then he'd be like, Oh, you my little dog. Listen here, little dog, do this. That's what we need to stop. That's what's that's a big problem. Okay, okay. I agree with you. So then now I'm this younger dude you talking to. So you told me what not to think. What should I think? 
you should figure out a path, man. Figure out a path to what you need to do to make yourself strong and successful, even if it's leaving the hood or even if it's being doing something that seems soft or if it's doing something that seems that, that other people will be like, man, what the fuck you doing? Don't worry about that. Do what you need to do to make yourself get ahead, no matter what it is. That means if it's working at McDonald's, just do it until you can figure it out. So what was your path? My path was all fucked up. I sold no, drugs. No, no. What was your path out? My path out was these kids. I needed to take care of them and sitting on my ass wasn't going to do it. And I didn't want them to ever look at me and say, this nigga trash. Like, how are we going to listen to him? They can't do that. They cannot do that. They look at me. They treat me like a king. They have to because I act like one. Did you earn the right? I, I did. I did. I made it. All these years, it, we, this is a tough area. I made it. I made it. I'm 44 years old. I ain't dead yet. Ain't nobody killed me. I feel like I'm past that stage, even though niggas still get killed. I feel, I mean, you know, I feel like I'm, like, when I tell these niggas something, it's the truth. And I know it for sure. I don't need no advice no more. I feel like I'm pretty much where I'm going to be, and I don't need nobody to help me. So, yeah, I don't, yeah, I feel like, yeah, that what I say to them is accurate and 100% real. So, one of the things that I teach people when they in their liberation process is that if you know what you know, then maybe you could stop thinking about survival and think about thriving and liberation instead, since you did it already. That's real. And I'm I'm thinking about that. I'm I'm thriving because I work hard, and but I'm thinking about surviving because I need to to be no, able to But if you out. thrive then survival is a guarantee. Well, maybe not a guarantee, everybody that. But so, <laughs> when you're thriving, survival is kind of already included. So you really have to think about survival if you're thinking about thriving. I thought it went hand in hand. I thought I, I think I need to do both. I, I think I need to survive. I think I need to thrive to survive. Like that's how I feel. I think that you need. Yes, I agree with you. Thrive to survive. So the focus should. If you th focus on thriving only, you'll automatically be focusing on survival. So you don't have to think about threats to survival. You can think about surviving and know that that insulates you from. I'm sorry. Think about thriving and know that that insulates you from not surviving. It is a mitigating factor. Okay, makes sense. But I'm working on both of those. <laughs> and one you are working on it, and you yeah. are doing it. Right. So now you get to ask Alexis. I was thinking about this question. <laughs> when are you going to get married and have some kids? Well, damn. Um, I've been doing a lot of work on myself. And I'm not sure. So I'm open to being, I like the way that I have parented throughout my life, which is as an ancillary parent. And because we're in a disassembled community, people that have the skill set to love me the way I want to be loved are few and far between. So then what I needed to do to learn how to be in partnership with others is learn how to love other people the way I want to be loved as well as myself and myself okay. first. Okay. So now I know how to love me the way that I want to be loved which means I know what to look for in the way other people love me. So I'm open to seeing how people love me and if I want to have a commitment. But can I tell you something though? Since you told me a lot of stuff. You oh, this, okay. this is why, hold on, let me brace myself. Let me get into okay. this part. This you is know, real shit. years too, so I, 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 I am nervous. Because this is real shit. So even though you may see a guy and he may not seem like he, up to your standard different women bring different qualities or different things out of different men so think about that i agree with you and i want you to know rob we haven't really talked about my dating life in the past few years um the thing that i focus on far more now than anything is how a person treats me and if they and how i feel in their company so I am doing well, like now I'm at a place where I'm, a, I, I'm a business owner. I'm an entrepreneur. I have some, I have value. I want to leave to the world for myself, which is separate from having a relationship. Right. I'm not saying, I say this, 
I don't really consider men's money when I am considering their eligibility, but I do consider their ability to handle money when I'm considering partnering with them. I do consider their emotional disposition when they don't have no money because broke men is angry man and I ain't got time to be around no man who angry all the time because they will take it out on you. Yeah. So, but, but let me say this now. Now, when I married, when I met Jasmine, when we started dating city, because we already knew each other, I was in EVS and she was a builder. She was making more money than me. She took a chance because I told her that I had plans to do more. I would do that, Rob. But what I'm telling you is I'm not about to, what I'm not going to do that Jazz did. And no, Jazz got a marriage. So I, it's not the marriage. But I will say this. I got, huh, I'm not speaking in a comparative way, but because I had things I want to do with my life, having a relationship is, a, is like something that adds to my life, not the goal for my life. And so I would do that because I plan to be making money. And I, if it's enough money, who gives a fuck who makes it? I want to do the things I'm doing that I make money, right? Like, so mm -hmm. I'm not going to stop doing them whether he got money or not. But broke men usually are mean and cranky and they have low self-esteem. And I do the work of holding space for people and their feelings and their self-esteem as uh, for a living. When I am at home in my safe space, I want to be cared for, and I want someone who already has the skill set of knowing that they have to do the little things so that I like to let me know, like so that I feel the feeling of love. Well, you deserve that, and you know, Phil ain't gonna let you get mistreated anyway. He gonna fuck him up, but he'll have to pay attention. Phil be busy in his own life, but he's doing better. Yeah, if something happened to you, Phil gonna pay attention. But sometimes that's some true. Men, some men need to be coached up. Remember that you just said that. Are some they going to pay me like people, my clients somebody. do, Rob? Are they going to pay me like my clients do? Because do you want to work when you get home? Like, is the thing that you're thinking about when you get home driving a truck? Probably yes, because you got anxiety. But if you had to plan it, would you want to be thinking about driving a truck at home or you want to be at home connected with your family? No, I want to be at home connected with my family. But when I met Jasmine, I knew I needed to do more. I couldn't just be... An average nigga, I needed to do not not say that she demanded more. She was comfortable with me because I was doing more. I, I I would do side shit, but fuck all that. I needed to do more and had that to be the mainstream. So I decided to just do more, and it worked for me. And it but it's hard work. It's niggas out here that can do that, but they not being pushed to do it. And so sometimes I, they don't feel like they need to do any more because ain't nobody saying you need to do any anymore. I do want somebody to also that knows to think for themselves to just do more because for them for their own value. However, I do chart people's progress, Rob, not their position. So if I see constant progress being made and he treat me well, then I would enjoy his company and I enjoy helping people build up. So it would it would be a thing that pours into me instead of takes away from me. But if all the effort is me spent doing the same thing that I do at work, coaching into him and getting no joy and love out of it, I understand that the thing I'm asking for is in some people's minds is like a unicorn. But what I'm saying is I'm satisfied enough with my own life that having a relationship is a benefit. So if it doesn't do that, I don't have to have it. I get it. I just want to see you as a mother and I just want to see your kids before we get too old. My purpose helps me mother the world. And I, that also is satisfying to me. So you might not get to see me as a mother. I'm not sure. I'm not saying, I think that I would be a really good mother, but I do have a fear that I can't be a really good mother and execute my purpose really good. And I would rather change the world to have children. Right, I feel you. I mean, you only sister I got. I don't really have my family. I don't have a sister. So, hey, when you do it, we'll be there to celebrate it. I appreciate that. and But I am open to the idea, and I am taking applications, y'all. If you want to love me, <laughs> see how you going to love me, and if I like it, I'll keep you. If I don't, I'm going to find my safety and belonging within myself because now I know it exists in me. You got to be nice, too. You can't just be right. trying to... You right. know, let me tell you something. That's not, we ain't going to go on and on, but you can't... You know, the biggest thing y'all do is y'all try to mold a person. You, you can't mold them. You got to try to get what's best and put add to it and then take it from there. The reason I'm okay with interviewing is because I know how well I love. Every, 
every purse, well, I'm not about to just toot, toot my horn, but I actually teach people how to love. That's how I know I know how to love. And then when a person loves me, I'm willing to put in, the, not just when, hell, when they don't love me, I'm willing to put in the effort. I'm trying to change that narrative in my life. So I will reciprocate love. I'm excellent at making people feel loved and knowing that I love them. The thing it was hard for me is knowing that, how to recognize people who know how to do that back. Right. And well, so, bl black women are choosy as fuck. They are. But if you keep me laughing, you make my life easier and you support my emotional stability with effort and action. That sound like Team Lex. Well, I hope you find that. You deserve it. So... There I it is. appreciate that. I appreciate yeah. that. I uh, if it finds me, I'll gladly accept it. But if you ain't wanting to, put, if I tell you this to anybody out there, do not put in an application at all if you don't want to actively love me. If you don't want to give me all your love, don't even come to the table. And I don't even mean like I, you come up and like with a ring and flowers, like oh I'm the one. I'm not saying that. But you got to see if you like loving me, which means you got to risk doing it. And not so you can't be afraid to love. You got to be willing to love so that you can see if you like loving me. And then if you do, and I like being loved by you, we'll stay together. If you don't, you'll stop. And then I won't like being loved by you because I won't be. And we won't stay together. That's the process of dating. I just don't want somebody who coming to the table with their fears and then want me to prove myself and earn their love. I don't do that shit no more. <laughs> that sound like a lot of shit, but okay. All right, well, hey, I wish the best for you. Well, all right, Rob, I appreciate that. For sure, for sure. My brother, and I love you, and you're definitely a love part of the family that we chose. Yes, uh, sir. We got many memories together and a lot of growth to be had. I appreciate you being on this comfy couch. No doubt. Um, Y'all can like and subscribe, and don't forget to share this because... I could feel it in my bones that this content was valuable. Even if you ain't find it valuable, share it so another black man can, right? Like share future or bust. We got to solve this problem. If you want to find more about my find out more about my services, you could go to askalexis111.com. Um, you can find me on all the social medias. And I do have a few slots left for the one-on-one -on -one personal transformation co coaching. And I have like one spot for relationship coaching. And then I have in January coming up the actively authentic allyship course. Um, that's probably going to be in mid to late January. We'll start the next round. And I believe myself and my co-facilitator have decided that it's going to be for 12 weeks instead of 10 weeks, just to make sure we can do the content a little bit more, give it more richness to experience. So thank you, Rob, for joining us. I'm going to cheer on your efforts along with <laughs> Cheer Bear here to do the practice of learning how to love so your family could grow up walking on Funshine. Wow! That's Funshine. It's got a, it's a sun. I can't even get the light right so you can see it, but... I can see it. <laughs> that's Funshine. All right. Don't forget, Rob, your heart can be tender. It feels good. Yes, it do. And one more thing, you don't have to be grumpy, Bear. <laughs> and you and Jazz are always welcome to share your emotions with me. Thank you very much. All right. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I'll talk to you soon. All right. <laughs>